routine and predict predictable uh, and transparent government-to-government uh, -government relations. Here's our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight, coming to you live on CGTN. I'm Tian Wei. We start in Iran, where a state funeral has been held for its top nuclear scientist, Mohsen Mahrizadeh, who was assassinated Friday. Tehran accuses Israel of plotting the assassination. Israel has not officially committed. Iranian President Hassan Rouhani says the country will seek revenge in due time. The Iranian parliament also demanded a halt to international inspections of the country's nuclear sites, while a top official hinted Iran should leave the global non-proliferation treaty. Some analysts say the assassination could seriously complicate plans of U.S. President-elect Joe Biden to resume dialogue with the Islamic Republic. The international community has condemned the assassination while warning against further escalation of tensions. The European Union has called Fakhrizadeh's killing a criminal act, which breaches the principle of respect for human rights. It's urging all parties to keep calm and exercise maximum restraint over the developing situation. Germany is also warning against any moves that could escalate tensions. Its foreign ministry on Saturday voiced concerns over the potential complications Fakhrizadeh's deaths may bring to the region. It called on relevant parties to keep dialogue open with Tehran, while noting the upcoming change of power in Washington. In the United States, senior politicians have also responded. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders has condemned the killing. He called the act provocative and said it was clearly intended to undermine diplomacy between the U.S. and Iran for the incoming administration. John Brennan, former CIA director under the Obama administration, said the killing risks lethal retaliation and a new round of regional conflict. He urged Iranian authorities to wait for the return of responsible American leadership before it responds against perceived culprits. In a phone call, Qatar's foreign minister told his Iranian counterpart that the incident will only pour more fuel on the fire as the world is seeking to resolve the issue through diplomacy and dialogue. And Turkey's parliamentary speaker is calling the killing an act of terrorism, which the country opposes on the international arena. For more on the assassination of Iran's nuclear scientist, join us in Tehran, Mohammed Morandi, professor at Tehran University in Boston, U.S., Jim Walsh, senior research associate at MIT's Security Studies Program, and in Beijing, Zhao Tong, senior fellow from the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Professor Morandi, I want to start with you. What exactly happened? There were conflicting reports about whether there were killing squad on the ground and then they were reporting about the satellite-controlled uh, 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 guns uh, killing. Uh, what exactly happened? Do we know now? Professor Morandi? No, I think that some of the media outlets are presenting differing accounts uh, for the sake of getting more clicks uh, on their websites. And uh, probably the Iranian government is also letting conflicting information come out for their own intelligence purposes. But uh, the most important thing is that the Iranians are quite confident that the Israeli regime carried out the attack. Uh, the evidence from Trump's retweets, as well as the New York Times report that three U.S. senior officials, unnamed officials, gave them the details about what happened. It's obvious that the Americans gave the green light. And uh, as in, on previous occasions where the Israeli regime murdered four scientists a decade ago under Obama, uh, the Americans probably provided extensive logistical support. And uh, the green light was a part of that broader process. So the Iranians believe at this stage uh, they have to retaliate. Mm -hmm both towards the Israelis in order to make sure that this does not happen again and that will probably be a lethal response of some sort. 
and also in order to punish the Americans and, and even the Europeans. The Europeans, as you read in the statement, did not condemn the attack. They called it criminal, but they didn't use the word condemnation. No, no European uh, or Western government used the word condemnation, uh, let alone call for an investigation. I see. So the Iranians will decrease their commitments to the JCPOA. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, Iran will probably uh, lessen its cooperation with the International Atomic Energy Agency as well. Okay. Mr. Walsh. What exactly happened now? It is Israel and the United States that have remained silent, even though Israeli authorities have warning their uh, overseas uh, uh, diplomatic uh, staff uh, to be extra cautious. So what exactly happened? What do you think really happened? Well, I think uh, there could be various motives, but it's certainly likely that Israel was responsible for the assassination. Why do I say that? Israel has a decades-long history going back to the 1960s of assassinating weapon scientists in foreign countries, including Egypt, Iraq, and others. So they have a bloody track record, so naturally people suspect them. And then you ask yourselves, who might benefit from this assassination? Mm -hmm. Who has motive? And again, it seems more likely that it would be like Israel, the U.S., or Saudi Arabia would be in that group of those with motive. And here there might be multiple motives. Israel might have been saying, hey, Trump's on the way out. Let's get this done while we have a shot, you know, while we're, we're, because we don't want the Americans to step in. Trump isn't going to object. Let's go do this while we still have a window to do it. That might have been a motivation. A second motivation may have been to disrupt diplomacy because Biden is uh, planning to reenter the JCPOA, the mm -hmm. Iran nuclear agreement, and perhaps Israel or Trump. It could be also a third possibility is that Trump requested this in order to help continue to kill the Iran nuclear deal. So lots of motivations, but I think at the end of the day, it was likely Israel who uh, actually executed that operation. All right, Mr. Zhao, of course, uh, China is one party of the JCPOA, uh, though uh, at this moment, uh, China is watching China condemn the assassination. What do you think will happen to the JCPOA and the future of uh, denuclearization uh, in Iran's case as a result of this? I think, of course, uh, people, I, I, you know, countries including China would hope that Iran uh, wouldn't overreact uh, because there is a fear that after the assassination, uh, Iran might uh, enhance its determination to uh, go full speed towards acquiring a, a military nuclear capability. Um, uh, certainly, China hopes that, and I think the, the broad international community also hopes that uh, Iran uh, doesn't go down that route. Um, I think, um, you know, as, as our American colleague uh, just uh, uh, explained, um, part of the reason this assassination took place this time might be uh, due to uh, the fact that uh, uh, Donald Trump uh, will uh, only remain in office uh, for two months or so. Um, so that's the last window of opportunity uh, for Israel. Uh, but that also uh, gives us hope, uh, on the other hand, uh, because we know that Biden uh, has a very different approach towards uh, JCPOA. Mm -hmm. And if Iran uh, uh, ref, uh, res, uh, res, restrains from overreacting and just uh, gives the next demonstration more time, uh, I think there is still a lot of uh, room uh, for a more flexible uh, approach uh, taken by the U.S. administration. Okay. And that could uh, pave the ground uh, for the U.S. and Iran both coming back into compliance with the nuclear, uh, Iran nuclear deal. Professor Morandi, the other two guests have been talking about uh, what would be the efforts coming from Iran. On the other hand, though, there is a, a very interesting issue about the U.S. politics, isn't it? Uh, that for four years, it's his pro one idea. Then for the next four years, it will be against an idea. And then for the next four years, it come back to the same idea. And uh, how do you think, uh, in this case, uh, Iran, uh, deeply involved in this cycle, uh, would react? Uh, how sustainable do you think Iran will have a plan about this? Professor. Well, I think it's obvious that Iran has no plans to pursue a nuclear weapon, and Iran never had a plan in the past to pursue a nuclear weapon. 
there is no evidence that Iran had a nuclear weapons program at all. And uh, Mr. Fakhrizadeh, uh, he was also responsible in the Ministry of Defense to help produce an Iranian vaccine mm. for the coronavirus. The, because of the sanctions, a lot of the major projects in the country mm -hmm. cannot be carried out by the private sector. So the military is deeply involved in many of these projects. So it's not, it has, there's no link between nuclear weapons and the peaceful nuclear program in Iran. But what will happen is that the Iranians will be forced to retaliate because if they do not, that will only encourage the Israeli regime to carry out more attacks. And Iran will be forced to decrease cooperation with the IAEA to punish the United States. And also, uh, it will decrease its commitments to the JCPOA. Remember, it's only Iran at the moment that is still abiding by some of its commitments. Western countries are not b abiding by any of them. Yeah. So this is a response to U.S. and Western support, but in particular U.S. support for is the, the actions of the Israeli regime. But the issue of Biden is a separate file. First of all, Iran is not very optimistic because we have to remember that the four other scientists who were murdered were murdered when Biden was vice president. And uh, the maximum pressure campaign of Trump began under Obama. He began these sanctions against the Iranian banking sector, which led to people dying. So the Iranians are not greatly optimistic, but they're willing to give Biden the opportunity to bring about change. The issue of retaliation is one thing, but if Biden is serious about fully implementing the nuclear deal, the JCPOA, and remember, under Obama, they never fully implemented it, never. For example, under Obama, I could not send one yuan or euro or dollar abroad or receive a dollar from abroad using the banking sector even after the deal right. was signed. But Iran is willing to give him that opportunity to change. If he implements the deal in full, Iran will implement the deal in full. Of course, allowing the U.S. as a member back into the JCPOA will require other things as well, including compensation for the damage done. Uh, but again, this the issue of retaliation has nothing to do with the file on Biden and the future of the JCPOA. That's no. in his hands. He, he can use presidential decrees to remove almost all the sanctions that Trump imposed almost immediately. Mm. Now, Mr. Walsh, we need to look at the recent year's history a little bit. This assassination, if it is an assassination, uh, certainly, to a certain extent, uh, we are going to see a series of uh, assassinations against uh, Iranian officials and key figures who are involved in the nuclear program. Earlier, there was uh, the Iranian uh, military official, then followed by four scientists, and now this one as well. So, uh, if bilateral relations is about mutual understanding, this certainly would uh, help the U.S. side, whoever comes into the office, to understand that the one that is constructive voices in Iran will be cornered as a result of this series of killings. So how, how will a Biden administration be able to do their first steps? It seems that what you earlier suggested is, well, the Iranians need to take the first few steps. But the Iranians are saying, you see, our people are already being killed in one killing after another. How could us take the first step? So. The ball has been kicked back and forth, Mr. Walsh. Yeah, so I, uh, I'm going to disagree slightly with my two colleagues here. I do not think the assassination will result in a major change in Iranian nuclear policy. They're not going to pull out of the NPT. And if they do something on uh, toning down their uh, participation in the Iran deal, it will be marginal and reversible. It's clear to me that both sides, Mr. Biden's uh, soon-to-be administration and the Iran current Iranian government have signaled that they are welcome to, uh, that they're open and look looking to rejoin the JCPOA. And the only way that's going to happen is if it's a clean uh, rejoining. You just go back to where it was and then negotiate extra things. There's gonna, if you wait to negotiate extra stuff like compensation, you won't get JCPOA. There'll be an election in Iran in the summer, there'll be a new government and that opportunity will be lost. The Iranian government was quite clear in saying they will retaliate at a time of their choosing. And I think they said that because they, they are not 
promising to do something tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And they're going to treat these things as largely separate. So they'll pursue retribution for the assassination at some point in the future. And if I was an Israeli nuclear scientist, I'd be concerned. But that's going to be separate from the JCPOA. I think both Iran, the Rouhani administration, and the Biden administration, if they can, want to get back to JCPOA before it is too late, because they may not have another chance as the year progresses, as 2021 mm -hmm. progresses. Very interesting situation. Mr. Zhao, um, this puts the other party of the JCPOA in a much trickier situation. The European Union, for example. I know you are not an expert about the European politics, but, but, but this <laughs> makes them, their role very interesting. Would they be able to bring the Biden administration back to the negotiation, back to JCPOA, while at the same time be able to correlate Iran's position, and of course our China could also play a role there, but we do not know what kind of role there will be as we progress this into a murky water of China-U.S. relation coming year after the inauguration. So, uh, Mr. Zhao, how do you see the others' role in this regard? Well, uh, the other players uh, have been trying their best to help. Uh, European countries uh, have been working on a new uh, financial system uh, to help Iran uh, get its uh, de uh, deserved economic benefits after the UN deal was uh, struck in 2015. Although due to American uh, undermining efforts, uh, that uh, European orchestrated financial system has not uh, been very impactful. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of China, Russia, they have also tried to resume legitimate economic and trading relationship uh, with Iran after 2015. Uh, chi uh, China, in its case, uh, uh, is also looking at some longer term uh, plan uh, mm -hmm. to uh, cooperate with Iran uh, economically. There is this discussion about a 25 uh, year uh, plan. Uh, that will uh, possibly introduce uh, more than 400 billion U.S. dollars worth of investment from China. So all these countries, what they are doing is trying to give Iran uh, its uh, deserved economic benefits as a result of self-constraint on nuclear program. But I have to say that as things stand now, uh, American and Iranian domestic dynamics are more important. Uh, both countries uh, in terms of their governments, their hands are tied. The um, you know, more liberal government today of President Rouhani will face a new election in summer. And in the case of, of the United States, uh, Biden, his hand is also tend, uh, tied by uh, more uh, hardline factions in the U.S. Congress. Uh, people uh, expect Biden administration to go beyond the original JCPOA. Mm -hmm. So how these uh, key decision makers uh, made their decisions and approach this very challenging issue is critically important for the result the other, of the resumption of the deal. The other thing, of course, uh, Professor Morandi, we should talk about the region, you know, the Middle East region. This, of course, will be another event that's likely to ignite more tensions among countries. Uh, Iran, Israel, to say the least, but then we also see some of the other Middle Eastern countries, uh, uh, for example, United Arab Emirates uh, earlier have been on better ties with Israel, and now we also see charter planes going back and forth, but uh, now things are getting complicated, and uh, also they condemn this act uh, of assassination. So how should we see are we likely to see from the Iranian perspective the involvement of the murky situation now in the Middle East uh, after this series of things happened? Professor Morandi. Well, again, this is an act of war that has been carried out against Iran. So Iran is not instigating violence or Iran is not the cause of the problem. Just like when General Soleimani, who was the key figure on this planet, to f uh, in the fight against ISIS, just was when he was murdered, it was not the Iranians who were uh, being aggressive. He was invited to Iraq by the Iraqi Prime Minister to have negotiations about some sort of rapprochement with, the with the Saudi Arabia, and the United States murdered him and his Iraqi counterpart. And in this case, again, a deputy minister uh, of defense was murdered in Iran. So this both were acts of war being carried out against Iran. 
So we cannot expect Iran to remain silent. Iran will have to respond. Mm. I agree with what Jim said about non, uh, Iran not exiting the NPT. There are some people who are calling for that, but I don't believe what at, at any point Iran plans to do that. Mm. But I do think that Iran's reduced cooperation will probably be substantial. Yet at the same time, I should also add that uh, the United States, if it wants to rejoin the JCPOA and become a member of state, it will have, there will have to be some sort of compensation. So if the United States implements the deal in full, the Iranians will implement the deal in full. But if the, Iran the, if the Americans want to become a member with the rights of a member within the P5 plus one, uh -huh. then the Iranians will demand something more, which I think is quite reasonable. Jim. Uh, Professor Morandi seemed to already line up some of the possibility, preconditions, and a series of actions that can be taken by both sides. Uh, step by step, uh, what's your take? I think it can happen. It's 50-50. Uh, it's I hope it does happen, but the clock is ticking on both governments. Here's what I mean by that. If Biden, uh, Biden's best chance is basically through executive order to rejoin and implement the JCPOA. If he makes any changes in it, including compensation, things that Iran wants, then that any change uh -huh. is then subject to congressional review and the Republicans still control Congress. So I think that since time is of the essence, and I agree that uh, this, you know, uh, I condemn all assassination, I condemn the Soleimani assassination, I condemn this one. But if we want JCPOA, we've got about six months, five months to get it done. I think we need to do it sooner rather than earlier because, again, Iran will have its own election and Republicans yeah. will seek to stall and, and, you know, stop anything Biden does in an attempt to have a, a successful midterm election okay. of their own. So if both parties, Rouhani and Biden, can get this done, that would be great. They have a chance, but it's not, it, time is, is of the essence. 50-50, that's your answer. I'm not sure many are as optimistic or 50 -50. pessimistic at the same time as you are. But for now, I want to <laughs> wrap up this conversation. I want to thank the three uh, panelists for providing your insights. Uh, Mohammed Morandi from Iran, Jim Wash from the U.S., Zhao Tong from China. Thank you, thank you so much, gentlemen. And be well, be safe.